Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Cesarich. In 1938, speaking to Spelman College in Atlanta, a 70-year-old W.B. Du Bois, one of the great intellectuals of the 20th century, said this, quote, I felt for a moment during the war that I could be, without reservation, a patriotic American. I did not believe in war, but I thought that in a fight with America against militarism and for democracy, we would be fighting for the emancipation of the Negro race. However, a bit later, and after reflecting about his visit with black soldiers in France just after the armistice, he said this, quote, I was convinced and said that American white officers fought more valiantly against Negroes within our ranks than they did against the Germans. I still believe this was largely true. W.B. Du Bois was talking about World War I, obviously, a war that he was an ardent supporter of at the time and used his standing to rally other African Americans to support the war. But as time went on and as black veterans of the war were oppressed and even lynched at home, W.B. Du Bois' views about the war changed. He spent much of his life trying to write a book about the African-American soldier's experience in the war. The manuscript of the book would change as he would change. In the end, the book was never published. However, many years ago, my guest today, Chad Williams, got a hold of this manuscript and he has written his own book about it. Chad L. Williams is our guest. He is the Samuel J. and Augusta Specter Professor of History and African and African American Studies at Brandeis University, and he is the author of the book that we will be in conversation about. It's called The Wounded World, W.B. Du Bois and the First World War. Chad Williams, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this program. Thanks for having me on. The manuscript of W.B. Du Bois's work about this was called The Black Man and the Wounded World, and and the, the title itself uh, would change through through time. Uh, it, it's remarkable. It's a remarkable story in of itself. How you even found this manuscript? W. B. Du Bois is, was was a prolific writer. Wrote two of the most important books of the 20th century: Black Reconstruction, The Soul of Black Folk, number of uh, numerous essays, other books. This one never never did get published. The story, how you found it, is remarkable though. It really is. So the story begins back in October of 2000, when I was a graduate student at Princeton University, just starting my doctoral dissertation on African American soldiers and veterans in World War One, which would eventually become my first book, Torchbearers of Democracy. And I was doing research at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and I saw a reference to Du Bois' World War One materials in their collection, where Du Bois' papers are are archived. And I was intrigued, thought I might you know, find something in it. So I go to the library, the W.E.B. Du Bois Library on uh, UMass Amherst's beautiful campus, go to the special collections department, ask the librarian to see these mysteriously named Du Bois World War I materials. She returns with six microfilm reels. So I'm totally confused. What could this be? So I load the microfilm and slowly start to realize that what I'm looking at is a manuscript by Du Bois on the Black experience in World War I that he never finished and never completed. The manuscript, 800 pages long, and envisioned 21 chapters. In addition to that, all of his research materials and the correspondence related to the project, just an astonishing archive. and really, from that moment on, I was obsessed with this with this project, uh, with with telling this story of trying to unravel the mystery of why Du Bois spent so many years, nearly two decades, trying to write what would have been the definitive history of the Black experience in the war, and ultimately never finished the book. Were you anticipating and finding just maybe a, a few columns, a, a few articles, a few notes about World War One and W. E. Du Bois? Instead, you find this this whole new world of of, of, of work that he was doing. Exactly, and I, I honestly didn't know what to expect. I guess I was hoping for the best, maybe some articles, some newspaper clippings. I, I really didn't know, but to literally stumble upon this this manuscript and the entire archive uh, related to it was, I mean, just imagine as a young, bright-eyed graduate student, it was it was just kind of mind-blowing. And as I would later find out, there had been some other historians who had talked about it in their in their works, but really no one, considering the 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 magnitude of Du Bois, um, the number of books that had been written on him, I was just really astonished that no one had spent time to to really delve into this this archive and to to really uh, talk about Du Bois's longstanding uh, interests and commitments to to writing the history uh, of World War One. It was just a gaping hole 
and the, the scholarship and knowledge related to Du Bois that I wanted to fill. The researcher's dream. It, it really was. <laughs> <laughs> World War I begins in Europe in 1914. The United States doesn't get involved until 1917, and then it's over by the end of 1918. Um, what's important to know about W.B. Du Bois as a figure in this country at that time? He would live a very long life. He, he would live 95 years, died in 1963. So this is still in the sort of the early, the, he's not necessarily a, a young, young man, but but this is no. earlier uh, in his intellectual career, at least. What's important to know about W.B. Du Bois at this time? I think what's important to know about Du Bois at the time of the war is that he was really at the height of his influence. He was in his prime, <laughs> we might say. Uh, Booker T. Washington, who was widely seen as the quote unquote leader spokesman of the race, passed away in 1915. Uh, so Du Bois really stood uncontested in terms of his uh, leadership stature, um, in terms of his voice um, as editor of the crisis, really respected as one of the most uh, influential uh, individuals when it came to this larger question of the Negro problem, as it was uh, characterized um, at the time. Uh, so the totality of his uh, intellectual uh, contributions, uh, his political commitments, really by the time of World War I, uh, Du Bois is really seen kind of as the, the voice of the race in many respects. And he comes out in support of World War I, which today, if people know W.B. Du Bois, at, at some, you know, a little bit later in his career, he, he becomes a communist, um, yeah. a pan-Africanist, um, very influential figure on, on the left and especially the black left. Um, but his support of World War I might surprise some people today. Uh, and I think it even surprised some people of his time, especially yeah. sort of left-leaning friends when there was... You had socialists and communists saying such things as this is a war over imperial conquest. Right. And Du Bois actually makes that, that argument uh, very prophetically, uh, really as early as 1914. And in 1915, he publishes really one of the landmark essays of the 20th century, The African Roots of War uh, in the Atlantic Monthly, where he argues that the roots of the war lay in the imperial competition amongst the European belligerents for control of Africa, its human and material resources, that that competition boiled uh, to, to such a point where it, it exploded uh, in, in Europe. Um, but Du Bois was also enamored with the possibility of democracy. I think it's really important for us to take seriously Du Bois as a democratic thinker, someone whose belief and commitments to democracy really began during his childhood in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. And he viewed the war as an opportunity uh, for the, the remaking of a democracy, certainly in the United States as it, uh, as it applied to, to African Americans, but even more broadly on a global scale, um, what the war would mean for the remaking of democracy for all peoples uh, of African uh, descent. So this was really at the heart of why he made the very controversial uh, decision, considering that he considered uh, himself a, a pacifist, uh, was, was adamantly against war. Uh, he saw this, nevertheless, as an opportunity uh, to, to, to make democracy uh, a reality uh, for Black people in the United States, as well as in the broader African diaspora. He writes this in an editorial um, with the NAACP's monthly magazine called Close Ranks. He says... Forget our special grievances and close our ranks shoulder to shoulder with our own white fellow citizens and the allied nations that are fighting for democracy. Did did he think black support and black participation in World War I would strengthen their hand at home for political equality or political rights? Yeah, he, he ultimately did. And it's important to... I think, situate Du Bois in a longer tradition of African-American military service uh, and Black leaders supporting uh, Black military service. Uh, du Bois considered Frederick Douglass one of his heroes. And in the Civil War, Frederick Douglass famously said, and I'm paraphrasing, let the Black man get the brass letters U.S. on his chest, and no one can deny that he is a full citizen and deserves freedom. So Du Bois, I think, was was envisioning World War I being akin to the Civil War in that respect, with Black men proving their worth, 
um, as soldiers on the battlefield, uh, amassing a heroic record and proving to white America that they were indeed full-blooded, 100% uh, uh, Americans. Um, he really put his faith in uh, the service and sacrifice of, of black soldiers uh, in particular. Um, and sadly, uh, as events would uh, unfold throughout the war and certainly into the post-war period, uh, his his hopes and his aspirations uh, for what the war would mean uh, were um, were dashed. I'm just going to underline a point you you already said, but I think it's important. It's it's he did have a nuanced view of World War One. It was that yes, this is an imperial war for resources, imperial war for resources in the continent of Africa. Uh, mm -hmm. However, the gains that can be made here are worth it. Is right? It, is that right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, and again, his his vision of of democracy was specifically rooted in his commitments to to freedom and and uh, justice for black people, as I said, in the United States and in the African diaspora. So this is the beginnings of Du Bois beginning to formulate um, what would become known as uh, the Pan-African movement of the 20th century. You know, thinking about what would it mean for Germany's former colonies, for example, to be administered by uh, an international governing body, to lay a groundwork for um, independence and, and ultimately self-determination uh, for Black people um, and uh, African peoples uh, in particular. Uh, so he was, I think, being very, um, very deliberate in how he was conceptualizing democracy. Uh, he was also being very forward uh, thinking as well. Um, and I think in that respect, we have to give Du Bois credit, uh, even though he ultimately was wrong. <laughs> I think we still need to, to take him seriously in that particular moment um, and not to kind of uh, view him in, in hindsight as being naive or, or, or blindly uh, misguided. Um, he was generally committed to his vision of democracy uh, in the kind of heated throes of the war. So why did he see Germany and, and its allies a threat to democracy? And, and did he see it as a threat to black people globally? Yeah, I think that was really one of the most difficult decisions Du Bois had to, to come to. And it ultimately came to it really at the beginnings of the war. Keep in mind, Du Bois had incredible fondness for, for Germany. He studied in Germany uh, two years at the University uh, of Berlin uh, while he was working on his doctorate at Harvard University, first African-American to receive his doctorate um, at, uh, at Harvard. So he really considered... Uh, Germany, a, a significant part of his identity, um, and he writes about this extensively, how his time in Germany uh, really shaped his, his intellect, his personal tastes, um, his worldliness. Um, but nevertheless, uh, he saw uh, in Germany um, a, a much graver threat, uh, certainly than that of, of Great Britain and France, both of whom were imperial nations, had their own ugly records of uh, colonial uh, exploitation. Uh, he saw, particularly in German militarism and uh, the, uh, the the racialist aspects of, of uh, German uh, imperialism uh, being a, a much more significant threat to the hopes and aspirations and freedoms of, of Black people throughout the world, and especially uh, in Africa. Is it like a lesser of two evils? In some ways, yeah, and I think Du Bois, as the years would would evolve, uh, he would come to to adopt that view. Um, you know, he'd become much more critical of both France, um, uh, England, certainly uh, the United States throughout the 1920s and 1930s, uh, really taking a much more uh, kind of nuanced view of the origins of the war and the European nations that were uh, participating in it. Um, but he still placed most of the blame on on Germany. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's interesting. We'll, we'll get into that about how he responds to his own previous views uh, uh, about the war as, as time would go on. At the time when he announces his support, not just his support for the war, but he's trying to rally, again, African-American community to support mm -hmm. World War I, uh, he comes under great criticism for that. Yeah, he, he does. And you know, I think Du Bois' stance during the war it really goes back to his classic 1903 book, Souls of Black Folk, uh, which you mentioned. And in that book, he writes about double consciousness, right? This sense of being black on the one hand and American on the other. And the tension between those two aspects 
of African-American identity and the desire, the longing to reconcile those two warring ideals as he characterizes him. And he saw the war as the moment, as, as the moment where those two warring ideals could eventually uh, be reconciled. And this is why he's encouraging African-Americans to, as you said, set aside their special grievances, to close ranks with their fellow white Americans and the other allied nations that are fighting for democracy. Um, and at the time, he is he was he was heavily criticized. Um, he was seen as as abandoning the cause um, of racial justice. He was accused of being a traitor to the race. And if you think about Du Bois as someone who literally dedicated his life to the service, the sacrifice, the uplift of the race, to be accused of being a traitor was really the most kind of damning charge you can levy at Du Bois. And that really stung him, as I argue in the book, you know, to his core. And, you know, he tried to justify his, his decisions at the time. Um, and he really came to, uh, to, to, to regret uh, that, that decision um, and ultimately spent, you know, some two decades trying to, to write about the war and rationalize it uh, through, uh, through his book, uh, which, as you said, uh, he never finished. He, he almost became a captain in the war effort for the Department of War. It was called the Department of War at the time. Right, right. So again, so this is part of the intrigue <laughs> that, I, that I write about in the book. Um, at the time uh, Du Bois writes his controversial editorial, Close Ranks, he's being considered for a captaincy in the military intelligence uh, division. So, you know, think about kind of the precursor to, to the modern day, you know, State Department, the NSA. Uh, and... Uh, du Bois saw this as a you know, really kind of career defining uh, decision. Um, ultimately, the captaincy offer uh, didn't materialize because of some of the, the criticism and, and backlash uh, regarding his close ranks uh, editorial. But it's really illustrative of how Du Bois saw himself at the time. And he writes about this in, in some of his later writings as as closer to being an American than at any other time in his life. He believed that by supporting his country, by even becoming, you know, a, a military agent <laughs> for, for the War Department, he was doing his duty to his country. And ultimately, that would lead to greater rights for, for his race. Um, it was an incredibly risky bargain uh, that he was engaging in and one that he would ultimately come to regret. This is Letters and Politics, and we are in conversation with Chad L. Williams about his book, The Wounded World, W.B. Du Bois and the First World War. Chad Williams, also the Samuel J. and Augusta Spector Professor of History and African and African American Studies at Brandeis University. Tell me about W.B. Du Bois's visit to France to visit U.S., I, I believe U.S. soldiers in France, maybe more. You, you'll explain, because, of course, France has its own black population, I, I, I suspect, has its own soldiers. I'm, I'm yeah. actually going off my notes now. I'm not sure if any of that's true, but I assume. Yeah. Uh, but but he goes to France just after the armistice takes effect. Yeah, yeah it, and it's really a, a remarkable journey, and I kind of chronicle every step of Du Bois's remarkable three months in France uh, from December of 1918, right after the armistice to March of 1919, how he is one of the few African Americans to get a passport to, to go to France. He travels on the official press ship, uh, accompanying Woodrow Wilson uh, to the peace conference uh, in Paris. Um, and he has this remarkable experience where he organizes a landmark Pan-African Congress in February uh, of 1919, but his principal mission, as he characterized it, is to begin research for his book on the Black experience in the war. And he meets directly with Black soldiers and officers. He visits them in the encampments. He travels along the Western Front. And directly from the mouths of these men, he hears about the horrific racial discrimination that they experienced, how systemic white supremacy was throughout the entire uh, American expeditionary forces uh, in France. And it really shocks him. Uh, and he returns back to the United States um, determined to tell their story, uh, returning with uh, primary source documents for his book, letters, diaries, official military documents, all proving this how uh, systemic uh, the racism of the United States Army was. 
And this really steals his commitment to telling the history of the black experience in the war, but also telling it in a particular way that exposes the racism of the United States, exposes the hypocrisy of the United States in its claims to be fighting for democracy, but to also do justice to the service and sacrifice and heroism of these black soldiers and officers who he formed a very close bond to while he was in France. How would he and how would you describe, and again, this is sort of your topic, how, how would you describe the treatment of black soldiers in World War I? It was thoroughly racist. Uh, the United States Army was completely segregated at the time. Approximately 380,000 black soldiers served in the war. Uh, the vast majority served as laborers, um, doing all the dirty work of the war as stevedores, loading and unloading ships, digging ditches, laying railroad tracks, uh, burying dead bodies. And this was how the military envisioned uh, black men serving in uh, the armed forces by and large. You know, this was part of kind of the natural capabilities of how they saw uh, black men as uh, as natural laborers. However, there were two black combat divisions, uh, the 93rd Division, which was composed uh, mostly of National Guardsmen, and the 92nd Division, which was composed of draftees. Uh, and Du Bois was deeply invested in telling the history of these black combat visions, uh, divisions uh, in particular, um, and as I said, exposing the, the racism uh, that they experienced, particularly the 92nd Division, which was unique because it had black officers. And Du Bois considered black officers to be the future leaders of the race, what he characterized as the talented 10th. Um, and he was uh, connected on a personal level to many of these men. He, he knew some of them personally. Um, and uh, a lot of the racism that they experienced uh, was, uh, was because uh, they were officers, because they were in positions of leadership, uh, because uh, many white men in the army saw them as as uppity or kind of stepping out of uh, the natural hierarchy of, um, of of what it meant to uh, to be a black person in relation to uh, to white men. Uh, so Du Bois was deeply aware um, of just how racist uh, the military was um, at this time uh, because he heard it directly from the mouths uh, of these men. And that was going to be a central part of the story he wanted to tell in his book, uh, which we said he spent so many years working on. So you have the racism that occurs against black soldiers while at war, while, while overseas. And then you have the experience of these black soldiers as veterans coming home and what happens in the years after the war. In fact, the very next year, uh, tell me about this. What, 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 what is what we refer to as um, Red Summer of 1919? Right. So I, I devote a, a chapter in my book uh, to talking about the post-war experience, the immediate post-war experience of Black veterans returning to the United States in the summer of, of 1919 with hopes and aspirations that their service was going to make things better, um, that they were going to be recognized um, as full citizens. Uh, and they were uh, and they were shocked uh, by the reception that re they received from white Americans all over the country. Race riots uh, erupt in Chicago, uh, Washington, D.C. Black men, black veterans are being attacked literally right in front of, of the White House. There's a, a full-scale massacre in, in Arkansas. The number of lynchings skyrocket. Uh, black veterans are being attacked, lynched, some still in their uniforms. So James Weldon Johnson, uh, the brilliant African-American intellectual, artist, um, civil rights activist, one of Du Bois's colleagues and close friends, as I talk about in the book, he described these months of, of, of 1919 as the Red Summer because of the bloodshed uh, that was taking place uh, throughout the country. Uh, and Du Bois was, was shocked by, by the violence. Um, and he, he described it as a time of, of, of unexpected reaction because he was hoping that things uh, would, would turn for the better as a result um, of the war and the sacrifices of black veterans and just the opposite happened. So this was really the beginnings of a, a process of deep disillusionment that Du Bois experienced and internal questioning, reckoning with the legacies of the war and his own 
very complicated place in it. It's sometimes seen and, and talked about that black soldiers in World War One, when they come home, and with all that that you just laid out, was still an important moment in setting an early civil rights movement. Do you think that's accurate? I do think it's accurate. Um, I, I write about this in my first book, Torchbearers of Democracy, and I and I write about it in in the Wounded World. How you have black veterans coming back to the United States, determined to make democracy a, a reality. Um, so they really change the uh, social and political consciousness of Black America. Right? There's a heightened racial awareness that these men uh, return back to um, after their their service. And it lays the groundwork for what we know today as the modern civil rights movement. Membership in the NAACP increases. You have a number of different radical organizations, which Black veterans are a part of. The Universal Negro Improvement Association, uh, led by Marcus Garvey. Um, Black veterans were at the core um, of, uh, of that organization in the United States. So the service um, uh, of Black uh, soldiers uh, was very important. Uh, symbolically for for shaping under the post-war civil rights movement, but also tangibly uh, in terms of their participation in a number of different organizations and the contributions uh, they make uh, to, as I said, what we know today as the modern civil rights movement. Sticking with Red Summer of 1919, for one, one more question here, W.B. Du Bois would lead a protest in New York City. It was a silent protest. It was called the, the Silent Parade. And this was in response to a massacre that had happened in East St. Louis. What happened in, in East St. Louis? And, and tell me about this silent parade. So in July of 1917, uh, really just a few months after the United States enters the war, there is a horrific racial massacre in East St. Louis, uh, Missouri. So I was um, wrong about the date there. For, forgive me. This was 1917. This, is this was 1917 yeah. during during the war. And, and that's significant. Um, African-Americans... Um, by by the hundreds, I mean, the exact count will, will never be known, but likely well over 100 African-Americans, men, women, children, the elderly are brutally slaughtered uh, by uh, white mobs in East St. Louis. It's it's truly horrific, an American pogrom. Uh, and Du Bois actually travels to East St. Louis uh, in the days afterward to conduct research, to investigate uh, what happened. Um, and um, a few weeks later, uh, he and other um, African-American civil rights leaders, including James Weldon Johnson, uh, organize and lead what was uh, described as the silent protest parade, where over 10,000 African-Americans marched silently down Fifth Avenue uh, to the sound of, of muffled drums. It was an incredible display of um, Black militancy um, on the one hand, but also Black respectability uh, and dignity and staking claim to their rights as American citizens, you know, holding up signs during the parade saying, uh, and I'm kind of paraphrasing, Woodrow Wilson, make America safe for democracy. Uh, it was a, an incredible moment and really significant in, in, in laying the groundwork for, as we were discussing earlier, uh, the, the modern civil rights movement that would uh, evolve uh, both during and in the aftermath of, of the war. Again, important. That's 1917. Forgive my error there. I, I promise you I yeah. make them often. Uh, <laughs> no worries. But, but, but this doesn't yet change. He doesn't turn on the war yet. I mean, this doesn't change him yet on the war. As you said, it's significant that this is a, a silent parade, a silent protest. It is. It is. And again, the intent was to demonstrate the, the dignity, the respectability of Black people to make a, a, a juxtaposition, a contrast between the civility of Black people, right, their commitment to, to order, and the incivility, the savagery of the white mobs who were killing Black people in uh, East St. Louis at the same time as Woodrow Wilson is claiming that the United States is going to make the world safer for, for democracy. Uh, again, it's really an incredible moment, but speaks to the challenges uh, Du Bois faced in supporting the war, but also the broader question that African-Americans, Du Bois inc included, um, had to wrestle with, this question of loyalty, right? What it meant to be loyal to a country that was not loyal to you. Uh, what it meant to fight for a country 
that literally despised your citizenship and even your your very humanity. That's the tension Du Bois and so many a- other African Americans were, were wrestling with. And I think it's it's incredibly um, relevant even today, which again speaks to I think the, the timeliness of, um, of of my book um, and you know how it does you know speak to issues that you know are, are still so relevant in our contemporary moment. Again, the manuscript's called The Black Man and the Wounded World. Um, the, its title would change, as I think his views of the war would change. Tell me about the process of, of writing this manuscript, what he meant to be a book, um, and, and his process and also his, evolve, his evolution in thinking about the Great War. Right. So Du Bois is tasked with writing this book in October of 1918. The NAACP Board of Directors and say, we need to, to write a book about the Black experience in the war now that it looks like uh, the Allies are going to win. And Du Bois leapt at the opportunity uh, to write this history. Uh, du Bois, being a historian trained in history, but also viewing this as an opportunity for kind of redemption um, in, uh, uh, in light of the criticism that he received as a result of, of closed ranks, an opportunity to demonstrate his continued um, you know, leadership and, and relevance. So he really commits to to working on this book, you know, right as the war comes to an end. He initially titles it um, the, the the Black Man in the Revolution of the 20th Century, right? Mm-hmm. So envisioning the war kind of as this revolutionary moment in shaping uh, the, the history as well as the future of, of Black people in the 20th century. But as the years go on, Right, as he has to live through the red summer of 1919, as he lives through other moments of of uh, disillusionment, both personal as well as as political, his views of the war uh, begin to change. Right? And he no longer views it as a revolu- revolutionary moment. He views it as a tragedy, um, as one of the most tragic moments in modern world history. And that informs his decision to rename uh, the book around 1923 as the black man and the wounded world. And I think it's such a remarkably evocative title and you know, really makes us think about kind of the question Du Bois was, was asking in coming up with that title. What does it mean to live in a wounded world? What type of world, what type of wounded world did the world war create? Um, and he was wrestling with that, that very profound question. Right. In some ways, uh, a question that uh, black people today are, are still wrestling with. What does it mean to live in, in a wounded world, a world that's scarred by war, by by racism and white supremacy, um, by the lack of, of democracy, uh, by empire and, and colonial exploitation? Profound questions that Du Bois is wrestling with in the context of World War One uh, in its aftermath, but questions that I think are are timeless as well. Does he ever escape the mark of criticism he received for supporting World War One? No, he doesn't. Um, and I think if he were alive today, <laughs> he would he would still be be wrestling with that that decision. Um, as I chronicle in the book, um, World War Two is is a moment where he's forced to reckon with his decisions that he made in, in World War uh, One uh, once again. And at the time, you know, there are our critics, you know, in the black press and elsewhere who are revisiting Du Bois's stance during World War One and saying, we're not going to make the same mistake that Du Bois made in World War One and calling for black people to close ranks and forget our special grievances. Um, in World War Two, uh, the double V campaign is the mantra um, created by the Pittsburgh Courier. So victory against fascism abroad and victory against racism at home, the double V. Um, that's a much different stance than Du Bois took uh, during during World War One. So even in that moment, you know, by the 1940s, he's still trying to make sense of his uh, decisions that he made, um, you know, so many years ago, uh, trying to justify it, but also recognizing, um, you know, the errors of his decision. Did he think he was wrong? He did think he was wrong, um, even though it was very difficult for him to admit it. Du Bois had a massive ego. <laughs> so uh, Du Bois actually admitting error, admitting that he was wrong about something was was incredibly rare. 
But as I talk about in the book, you know, there's all these remarkable examples, particularly in the 1920s and 1930s, um, you know, where he's experiencing a type of guilt, um, you know, a type of, as I characterize it, almost intellectual shell shock, right, of, of recognizing the weight of his error and trying to make sense of just why he made the decision to support the war in the way uh, that he did. Uh, so certainly by uh, the time World War II erupts, uh, he's, uh, you know, come to the, to the decision that supporting war um, is, is wrong in, in any uh, respects. Um, and by the 1950s, you know, he's at the forefront of the peace movement. So he, it's really this kind of remarkable full circle moment that takes his reckoning with the war and his ultimately uh, failed attempts to write about it to evolve into the ardent uh, anti-war activist that he becomes by the 1950s. Is he opposed to World War II? He recognizes that whether he is opposed to it or not, black people are going to be um, thrown into the war. Um, and uh, he makes the, the the decision that African Americans need to do their part. Um, but he's under no illusions that the war is going to result in better conditions for black people. That's really the, the main difference between his stance in World War I and World War II. Um, he's much more critical about what the war will mean uh, for black people um, and uh, you know what it means to to be loyal, uh, what it means to be a, a patriot. Um, you know, he uh, by that time saw um, speaking out uh, against war, being critical of of the United States uh, and the uh, entire war effort, really as uh, kind of a form of patriotism in and of itself. And in, in j just before World War II, he's trying to get this manuscript published because it would be something good he thought to reflect on. You know, we're not calling it World War II yet, but you know, I think we're—I don't even think we're calling the first, the Great War, World War One yet. Um, but yeah. he's trying to get this manuscript uh, published before, in order to have, in order to be used as something to think about as we entered another global conflict. Exactly. So Du Bois tried for for many years to get support from different publishers and foundations and philanthropic organizations to. Um, support him in in writing and finishing the um, uh, the black man and the wounded world. He was largely un unsuccessful. Um, he travels to Europe. He travels to to Germany in the summer of 1936. Um, so he's in Germany during the Olympic Games in 1936 as Hitler is celebrating uh, the Third Reich. Um, he also travels through the Soviet Union. Uh, he visits China and Imperial Japan. So during his time abroad, he really sees the, the origins or, or the seeds of, of a future world war. Um, and he returns back to the United States, believing that if he could finish his book on the first world war, if he could finish the black man and the wounded world, it can serve as a warning call about the horrors of modern warfare, um, encouraging um, his, uh, his potential readers and potential supporters uh, to see this as an opportunity to avoid a future disaster. And unfortunately, he doesn't get uh, uh, funding support uh, for, for the book. Um, and by 1940, as uh, the Second World War uh, erupts, uh, he makes the really a tragic decision uh, that he's not going to, to finish uh, the book. Um, and um, I think it's really, uh, again, this, uh, this moment uh, where Du Bois's disillusionment, you know, really comes um, comes full circle, um, and he, he sees uh, the legacy of uh, the First World War as being one of of total failure. Do you think it was just bad timing at that point? The the the, the war fever has has caught on, and and this just isn't the time to publish it. And is that also do you think a reason why he couldn't get the funding to finish the book? So I think there were certainly practical reasons why Du Bois wasn't able to, to finish his book, lack of funding support being, being one of them. But there's actually a moment where he does receive funding support. As I write about in the book, uh, he receives a two-year uh, fellowship from the Rosenwald uh, Foundation, uh, which he used to starting um, Black Reconstruction, 
uh, his massive, uh, monumental, pathbreaking history of the Reconstruction era, uh, which you referenced um, earlier. But that fellowship was also intended for him to finish the Black Man in the Wounded World. And he made the decision that he was going to work on Black Reconstruction over finishing his book on the First World War. And I think that's incredibly telling. It speaks to how difficult it was for Du Bois to write about the history of the war, to conceptualize it, to make sense of it as a historical moment, but also as a deeply personal moment as well. So as I argue in the book, the failure of Du Bois to ultimately um, uh, not complete uh, his book was really about him. Uh, it was really about his own inability to, to make sense um, of the war and to muster the, the intellectual and moral strength uh, to finish this book. It's hard to overstate the importance of his book, Black Reconstruction. Uh, before Black Reconstruction, the the main narrative of the Civil War was one of the lost cause, uh, uh, an aggressive North that took away state rights from from the South. And it's his book that I think it's still argued about today, but has become more of a mainstream thought about what the Civil War was really about. And it's because of his, in some ways, you could see sort of the 1619 Project today equivalent to what the Black uh, Reconstruction was uh, when it came out, I believe, in, in the 1930s. 1935. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is is the fact that he's working on this as as at the same time he's also working on this manuscript about World War One soldiers? Do do you think those together also started to shape his ideas about the validity and the value of world of the First World War? Yeah, as I write about in the book, he's wrestling with the the ideas at the heart of Black Reconstruction at the same time as he's wrestling with. The history and legacy of, of World War One. So, Du Bois actually envisioned his book on the First World War as being a sequel to Black Reconstruction. He saw the two books as as connected, about telling a larger story about the struggle for democracy for Black people in the United States and throughout the world. So, his global vision of what. Uh, the Reconstruction era meant uh, was certainly informed by his kind of reckoning with uh, the history and legacy of World War One, as well as his very ideas about about democracy uh, itself. Uh, so I think as we kind of reflect upon, you know, the brilliance, you know, the prophetic nature of of Black Reconstruction, how it's completely uh, informed how we think about uh, the Civil War and Reconstruction era today. It's important to keep in mind that he's also wrestling with another war, an, another moment, um, you know, the legacy uh, of the First uh, World War and how these two histories, one that he finished and another one that he didn't finish, were ultimately inextricably connected. He also came under increased criticism for not publishing this book because there were so many Black soldiers and, and families of, of Black soldiers who sent letters and mementos and, and just, you know, archival stuff to him to be used for this book. Eventually, they wanted that stuff back. Yeah, as I write about in the book, the relationship that Du Bois had with uh, Black veterans was, was so unique. Uh, he essentially used them as his research assistants. Um, he would uh, send out uh, messages or send out uh, calls in the Crisis magazine, which he edited for Black soldiers to send him their materials to make sure that the history he was writing was 100% accurate, that it could not be disputed. Um, and they trusted Du Bois with their artifacts, letters, diaries, beautiful photographs, uh, individual portrait uh, photographs, even parts of the manuscript uh, itself that Du Bois worked on was provided uh, by um, by Black servicemen. So they formed a, a very tight bond with Du Bois and really invested in him their hopes and historical visions. And really one of the most tragic aspects of Du Bois not finishing the book is that he never returned most of these materials back to these men. Uh, the majority of those uh, materials are still in Du Bois's archives, uh, the original materials located at this university uh, in their special collections uh, department. Uh, so that's, I think, a, a really important part of the story that I wanted to tell uh, in my book. Do families still want it today? 
that really remains to be seen. I think most families don't know uh, about this this archive. I think most historians <laughs> don't know about this archive. And you know, I think you know, perhaps <laughs> my, my book uh, will will uh, will generate some conversations uh, about um, what we what we think of this um, archive, and maybe even uh, spark some interest in. Uh, the the families of, of some of these veterans to to explore it and see if their um, their materials are are in there. W. B. Du Bois died in 1963. Do you, do you know what happened to the manuscript? the The black man in the wounded world. Do you know what happened to this manuscript after his death? So the original manuscript, as well as all the archival materials, are located at Fisk University, uh, which was Du Bois's uh, alma mater, his undergraduate alma mater. Uh, so I believe in uh, the the early 1960s, it may have been right around 1961, um, he donated a, a bulk of his papers to Fisk University, and the Wounded World manuscript um, and and materials were part of that collection he donated uh, to Fisk. So that's how they arrived in Fisk University, where most of his other papers were uh, ultimately uh, donated to the University of Massachusetts uh, Amherst. So the manuscript in all of its beauty and all of its messiness uh, is, is is still there. And I've had the opportunity to look at the physical manuscript. It's really an incredible uh, glimpse into Du Bois's evolving thought process uh, about uh, about the war. But after his death, it was just mostly forgotten about by, by the public at, at large. Yeah, there were some efforts um, on the part of Herbert Aptheker, uh, who would uh, ultimately publish uh, a number of Du Bois' uh, unpublished and unfinished works to explore you know, possibly bringing it to the public. But even Aptheker uh, saw it as a project that was too big and too massive for him to devote uh, the time to. Uh, so it, it did. It has sit there, has sat there, largely uh, forgotten. Do you think now that you've brought this attention to this manuscript? I mean, it is a fascinating story. Do you think there's any chance this could ever be published now? I think there's certainly some some possibilities. Um, I mean, there need to be conversations with the Du Bois estate and with Fisk and kind of all those questions uh, regarding publication rights and yeah, uh, things of that sort. <laughs> and, you know, those can get kind of, kind of messy uh, and complicated. But it's really, I think, uh, as I said, a, a unique example of Du Bois um, as a historian, you know, working over a long uh, period of time, some of the chapters are quintessentially Du Bois in terms of the writing quality, in terms of the beauty of, of the prose, the analytical sophistication. Uh, other chapters are definitely a work in progress, um, literally pieces of, of paper cut and pasted on top of each other. Uh, some of the chapters are, are not even fully written, just, just sketched out. So um, I think it would entail some creativity to to think about what it would mean to bring it to the public. Uh, but I do think that it would be uh, a remarkable um, example uh, to to give uh, the larger public about Du Bois uh, and his and his work. And, and finally, is it available online or would you actually have to physically go see this manuscript? You have to physically go there. Yeah, um, there's some pieces of it which are available through the University of Massachusetts um, Du Bois paper archive, which is digitized, but the full manuscript itself is uh, physically located at um, at Fisk University in their library. And of course, you can learn a great deal about it by by your book, as as I have, as I'm thankful that I've learned about it because it really is a remarkable story. Chad L. Williams has been our guest. Chad L. Williams is a Samuel J. and Augusta Spectre Professor of History in African and African American Studies at Brandeis University. He has joined us for a conversation about his book. It's called The Wounded World, W.B. Du Bois and the First World War. Chad Williams, I've enjoyed our conversation very much, and I thank you. Thank you very much. It was a great conversation.